Good morning and welcome to our daily devotion from St Swithin's Anglican Church in Pimble. We are meeting on Monday, December 6, 2021. It's the second week of Advent. We pray that all your family, wherever they may be in the world, are safe and well. Today we continue our journey through the New Testament book of Acts. Today reading from chapter 6 verse 1 to chapter 7 verse 19. You may like to pause this recording and read the passage. When you were younger, did you ever think about a place or an institution or a family, idealistically, that they never argued? or even disagreed about what television program they were going to watch, or which takeaway they were going to have for dinner? Mickey Gumbel, in our reference, The Bible in One Year, challenges us to confront the idealistic notion we may have about the lives of the disciples, that they, having a common purpose and goal, never disagreed or turned away from any issue. But it is when we read passages such as Acts 6 and previously read Acts 2 and the eventful life of Paul that we realise not all was ideal all the time. Tom Wright, in his book Acts for Everyone, writes extensively on this very passage. As we saw at the end of chapters 2 and 4, those who were following Jesus had, from the beginning, shared their resources. This wasn't just a primitive form of communism, nor was it a sign, as some have suggested, that they thought the world was going to end very soon, so they wouldn't be needing property anymore. No, it was, rather, a sign that they knew they were called to live as a single family. They were the nucleus of God's renewed Israel. This, we recall, was why they had carefully chosen a replacement for Judas, so that the idea of the Twelve, the foundation of the renewed people, would remain firmly in place. Like any family in that world, and many in today's world, they would all own everything together. But how is that going to work when the family is suddenly double the size you expected it to be? How are you going to cope? You're going to have to sort something out pretty quickly. And the pressure in the early movement came to a head, not surprisingly, along a fault line which would continue to be a problem for many years to come. The subtle distinctions between people from different ethnic or linguistic groupings and the question of their relative status within the new movement. The problem came to a head over the treatment of widows. This shows that already in the early church, the question of living as a single family had clear negative as well as positive implications. Normally, widows would be taken care of among their own blood relations. But those family ties appear to have been cut when people joined the new movement. As in some of the parts of the world today, baptism meant saying goodbye to an existing family as well as being welcomed into a new one. And the new one, therefore, had to take on the obligations of the old. That, what, by the way, is why we find regulations being drawn up about such things in 1 Timothy 5, verses 3 to 16. Some have speculated that the problem was exacerbated in the case of the early church because many Jewish couples would come from far and wide in the Jewish diaspora, the dispersion of Jews all around the known world, to live in and around Jerusalem in old age, so that, eventually, they could be buried in the vicinity. The husband might then die, leaving a disproportionate number of widows 
from different geographical origins, all in the neighbourhood of Jerusalem. We all know that there's a period of adjustment when new families join, when new people join and others leave. A new wife or husband has to adjust many past ways when they join with their spouse's family. Everyone has to adjust when a new child comes along and has obviously not read the information from baby experts as to when they should eat, sleep and play, and even when they should come into the world. Such challenges are somewhat expected, and we all adjust, and this seems to be the adjustment the disciples needed to make. As Gumbel says, good leaders pick their battles carefully. They do not get involved in everything but take responsibility for everything. The apostles faced a justified complaint in verse 1. Yet they needed to concentrate on their primary task, prayer and ministry of the word. The solution lay, as it so often does, in effective delegation. The apostles dealt with the issue by setting aside a group of people who would wait on tables. Good leaders delegate and release others into their God-given gifts and ministries. Sound familiar? To me and with our church, this is exactly what still happens. Our wonderful and devoted home groups wait on tables, either figuratively or literally, with widows, widowers, and through all the eventualities of life of the families. Our talented flower ladies, the choir members and supporters, and of course the fabulous office staff and volunteers, all share their God-given gifts, allowing the ministry staff to concentrate on prayer and ministry of the word. In truth, without the sharing of these gifts and the hours of selfless effort put in by our congregation, the church would simply grind to a halt. Amazingly, though we see that this all started 2,000 years ago, not many institutions can say that. As we continue through Act 6, we see and read one of the best examples of a follower challenged by, for their faith and whose face was like the face of an angel. Stephen was chosen by the disciples to solve the problem of the widows. He was the obvious choice, a firm believer and follower, a leader who could delegate and attract loyalty from others and a generous and caring man. And because of his very nature, an obvious target for those opposed to the new movement. It seems it was easy to spread rumours in those days. No, no television or internet, but the origin of the grapevine, the rumour mill. A few well-chosen words or phrases in the street at the market or outside the synagogue, and the word spread rapidly as it was intended. It reached its target, the Sanhedrin, and they were forced to act, hauling Stephen up before them to answer the false and unfounded allegations. Maybe they thought he would plead guilty just to make it all go away. Maybe he would become violent giving them the perfect excuse to throw him in jail. What they did not expect was Stephen's quiet, calm demeanour as he challenged their beliefs. We read again from Wright. It was extremely serious for Stephen as he stood up to defend himself against charges which, if they stuck, 
would likely call for the death penalty. He had been accused of speaking against the temple and the law, of saying that Jesus would destroy the temple and change the customs which Moses had given, heavy as those customs were with cultural and religious symbolic significance. How was he to respond? He could simply have waved the charges away. They are obviously false. He hasn't been saying that at all. Or he could have avoided them and used the opportunity to speak about Jesus himself, his cruel death and astonishing resurrection, about the future hope and renewal of all things which was now coming true in him. Instead, he takes the bull by the horns and goes for the big picture. Tell the story again from the very beginning and get it right this time. Pace out the whole journey from Abraham onwards so that you arrive at the present moment at exactly the right speed and from exactly the right angle. Then, and only then, you will understand who Jesus is and what I and my friends who believe in him haven't been saying. In delivering this speech, Stephen and Luke in highlighting it so prominently is doing something which many other Jews of the time were doing in line with a long biblical tradition. For example, in Nehemiah 9, Daniel 9, Psalms 105 and 106, and in the first century, the major works of Josephus and sundry other Jewish writings. This explains why much of the speech doesn't seem to be a direct answer to the charges made against Stephen. What we have to do is listen carefully to see the way he is telling the whole story and to note which points out of thousands of different things that one could deduce as the moral from the different bits of the story he wants to highlight. Instead of a head-on rebuttal of the charges, he has chosen a kind of outflanking movement. Tell the story this way, he is saying, and you will see what I am saying about Jesus and how it relates to everything else that matters. Let us pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you for the example of Stephen and for Luke, for reminding us how to tell your story, how to bring it to life and into perspective for those hearing it for the first time. Lord, protect your people from rumour mongers, devious schemes and persecutors who will use any means to deny your existence and power. Help us, especially during this Advent, to bring the joy of your precious gift, your Son Jesus Christ, to all those yet to hear the wondrous story. We pray all these things in his name. Amen. We are here right up until Christmas. Please refer to our website for our Christmas services. And of course, on Friday the 17th of December, our carols in the park at Bannockburn Oval. Everyone is welcome. We pray for fine weather this year, no thunderstorms. We have a jumping castle coming for the children and we have food trucks, but bring your own picnic. Bring your neighbours and your friends and hear some wonderful singing as well as some fun during the evening. We look forward to seeing you then.